Uh, she's an independent researcher and human rights activist. Um, her research interests can be placed in the international and Canadian national areas. Um, her research interests are in the areas of conflict analysis. And uh, she is uh, going to be speaking on transitional uh, transitional justice. So, Fozia. Uh, Assalamu alaikum marlawad. And thank you for sticking around um, the whole time. I just want to start by saying I want to say thank you to the Virginia community for hosting the seventh annual um, Somali Diaspora Youth. And a special thank you to Saadia, Dr. Saadia Ali Adam, who is who's the engine behind this. Um, we, we need few Saadias in, in this community for us to. So I'm supposed to say a few things about transitional justice and a topic that I like, which is reconciliation. But there is a panel coming on reconciliation. And really, if you leave the transition out of it, justice is what we've been talking about all day today and every day we, we talk about. So I just want to take a few minutes to just reflect. I know, you know, I, I had a, a long speech about a few things, but maybe what is better um, as I adjust what I wanted to say is to really reflect on the idea of paving pathways. We talked about human relations, we talked about mental health, we talked about the, ne the necessity of connecting with one another, where the fist is more powerful than the fingers, right? And in that, in that, the, the, the human experience which we are living in, and we, you know, there's that Chinese saying that says, may we live in interesting times. We are living in very interesting times from Islamophobia to racism to you name it to you know hashtag me too and hashtag Adan studies and you know all kinds of, <laughs> of, of hashtags right and it's just an amazing time to be a female right um, and, and now that actually there is a public space to talk about all the things you know I, I was watching was it the global uh, Golden Globes or something where uh, he said you know ladies and the remaining gentlemen <laughs> you know because these days not every man is a gentleman we, we know that now for sure um, so just trying to really reflect on what is needed for us to because there is so many amazing things and amazing work just if we reflect on what has been presented today and how many experiences and initiatives and from community development to mental health, mental illness, uh, advocacy to, um, you know, the, the incredibly powerful Somali poem uh, that we heard. And, and hearing Brother Horsed and, 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 and Brother Arman and all the ladies who spoke today, uh, I think what is needed is finding those pathways. I have been around enough to know that there is an incredible amount of initiatives that Somali community everywhere. I'm from Ottawa, Canada, and we just had last week the awakening, which was also in its seventh year, led by a group of young male and female Somalis from Ottawa. So I think what my years of experience and years of being in here and in Ohio and in Minnesota and in Toronto and in Vancouver and in Edmonton is showing me is now is the time to find the pathways that link all these things from the sports history that we got today from Fainur right to the amazing work that the diaspora is doing back home but one thing I would like to also underscore is we are here to stay. You know, people in the Horn of Africa dream about going to the first world. We are in whatever it's meant by first world and there's no going anywhere else. So it's time to really own the power we can have within that can shape the foreign policy that is going to impact the Horn of Africa. Right? I've talked to many young professionals who say, how can I help from here? So the answer is not let's all take some money and go to Somalia. That is not the answer. 
good initiatives and good resilient people are doing work in Somalia. Somalia has become a phenomenon to study because it survived for 27 years without a central state that is effective. And I think that is partly the Islamic giving culture that we have been brought up in. Because we do share, whether we are doing minimum wage or a professional wage, the diaspora has been carrying the country on its back. And not only the country, the refugee camps as well. So we know how to share our resources. We know, and when I say we, is the proud we of Somali Ness and Somali Nimo. We know how to bring it on when there is a need. What we need now is connecting and finding the pathways that we can find to each other because time and again we have been divided in the name of everything, right? our identity, our community, our hafad, our city, our, you know, the states that we have now. So there are all kinds of historical divisions and divisions and divisions, and we have proven that we can survive. Not only have we survived, I think we have made it and have carved ourselves a community that is worthwhile to contend with. Now, the, 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 the critical part, and I am really proud as a parent of young professionals, I am really proud to have heard the young professionals that spoke today that had really some pretty much blunt, radical statements here, whether it's gender, whether it's, you know, uh, dealing with race, whether it's dealing within the Islamic Muslim communities and the structural inequalities within the Muslim community itself. We have young Canadian Somali women who are making movies and videos and, 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 and challenging the Muslim community because we do have racism within the Muslim community. It's not a monolithic one, you know, group. And I don't think anybody is one step away from being Adan. I think what needs to, to really, we need to open our eyes to is the fact that we are all doing things and ignoring the contextual class issues, right? I remember reading in the middle of the 90s, leftist female, feminists talking about how, you know, taking the, the, uh, the left stream of analysis saying they're ignoring the gender, right? So they have analysis of class that is genderless. Now, the other challenge became gender analysts and feminists were having conversations and analysis that were devout of class. And at the crux of the matter is class. Class and power and education is what divides people. And poor folk, whether they are white, brown, black, whatever those mean, you know, color identities are really a North American fictitious fetish because when you are in the rest of the globe, we don't talk about black people, you know, or, or, or white people or brown people. But our kids are growing up. My seven-year-old daughter, when she was seven, looks at a poster of people, multiculturalism in Canada, and she says, all the people are here, brown people, black people, you know, and there were some, you know, Asians, and so, so this color thing has a political connotation to it. I had to learn it. I came, I was a Somali girl, all right? And I came from a continent that had more than 50 countries that had multitude of ethnicities and I was relating to my Kenyan sisters as either Kenyans or Kikuyus or Maasai. I was relating to my Nigerian sisters as Nigerians who came from either the north of Nigeria or where Igbu or where houses and we came into North America and we all had to be black. It has its own sort of disorienting processes. But these are categorizations that people are keeping you in a box. Because the brother and the sister from West Africa and those of us from East Africa and those of us from the Caribbean, everybody is now black. When you know that's not real, right? But you are, because in North America it is real. Because North America thinks the world is North America. 
coming 1993 and watching the World Series of Baseball between Canada and, and the US. <laughs> so like, what is worldly about this? You know, it, it's, that is how insular North America is. That is how the world beyond North America is limited. So my spiel tonight, I'm gonna forget about transitional justice and focus on justice because it is justice. We need justice among classes. We need justice among people. We need justice within the family unit where the boys are raised one way and the girls are raised one way. Somebody really said something very funny. It's like the boys are braced if they wake up. You know, it's incredible how we just, they can go in and out of whatever boundaries we have, right? And they will be accepted into the fold immediately. Women can't do that. They can't afford to do that. Girls can't afford to do that. So the responsibility that we all have, the last seven years we talked about so many different themes, but I like the pathway theme because we need to find pathways that protect those who are doing human rights work. We need to link them across continents and across communities so they can not be saying one single story, right? We need to find pathways that create across community and across continent activist people that learn from their experiences because le practice-based learning, those of us who have been doing public sector evaluation for a long time now know you need more than the statistics. You need to actually observe a natural experiment, whether it's a health or education, and take that learnings, and it's not a cookie cutter approach where you can replicate the program everywhere. But understanding what worked, in what context, for whom, is where it's at. And if you connect people who are doing work in the Horn of Africa and in North America and in Europe, and they share those learnings, that is where the value add is. So finding pathways that connect people, finding pathways that connect the sports community across generations, right? And absolutely, the last five years I've been working on question, research questions regarding transitional justice. Transitional justice is a post-conflict justice because when you go through a conflict, whether you like it or not, you need to deal with it. You need to unpack that conflict so that it's not repeated. When and where and how will Somalia heal together? A social healing needs to happen. And I think sports can be really a, a door to enter. Because I grew up watching Shash and, and the Kismaya team winning all the regional soccer cups in Mogadishu. I remember how we all came together regardless of whose sub clan you belong to when people from Kismayo were playing soccer in Hammer. That was it. Arman can attest to that for me. It, you know, Jubada Hase used to take the cup every year. No, no, you know, no comments there. So we need to find a way to connect that and, and utilize that sports culture. We need to find paths to connect the, 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 what we talked about in terms of doing community work and the duty of service and the duty of positive service, because don't get me wrong, there is a dark side to community work too. We need to own that. Community people are not all malaik, you know, we are all human, we make mistakes, move on. <laughs> so we need to find those doing good service and positive service and link them up. We need to find ways to engage the socio-political institutions in this country and tackle not only Islamophobia, but oppression writ large. Whether it's based on gender, whether it's based on color of the skin, whatever it's based on. And we need to come together for the sole purpose of delivering on justice. Economic justice, political justice, justice in every sector because we live in a way I have been working in public policy for a long time and the dichotomy of the neoliberal agenda is you know we have people in the liberal the liberal party in Canada is supposed to be the good guys in the liberal caucus saying I am socially liberal and physically conservative we don't call them Republicans in Canada we call them conservatives 
we are still tied to the Queen, so we, we have conservatives and the Tory party. What does it mean when somebody says, I am fiscally, meaning financially conservative, but socially liberal? Here is the thing, when you are a public policy person and you understand what that means, what that means is, public policy contains social policy and economic policy. What capitalism and neoliberalism have successfully done is to separate the economic policy of the country from the social policy of the country. So here we have all the doing good people and social service people having conversations about how to address social ills at the larger population level without having access or being privy to the economic purse of the country. I mean, that in itself is flawed, right from the get-go, because it's an artificial. You cannot make a decision about how to tackle HIV in this country without knowing what country, what this country affords in its GDPs, what it can, like, but when those two tables are separated, and this is a very macro level I'm talking about. And you've got the economists and the bankers talking to the politicians separately about how to maximize profit. Then you end up with the recent report we had where the wealth of the globe for the last God knows how long is still concentrated in 1% of the, of the population of the world. So those are the things when I say we need to tackle ways to come together and find pathways to link up with those who are doing social justice, socioeconomic justice and human security, not the security that is manufacturing guns to be used by somebody else over there, but a human broader welfare conversations so and I've been challenged early on to sort of say why is it those of you in the diaspora can only influence and talk about Somalia why can't you why can't you change some institutions here including the foreign policies that are impacting negatively our regions so my spiel tonight is going to be let's remember pathways and let's remember finding paving them and linking all the good work that is happening at a grassroots level and come together for the sake of justice in humanity. Thank you.